Okay, everyone get out your cell phones uh, and bar, barcode, or yeah, barcode scan my QR code. Are you done? Yeah, that's how you can contact me. Now that's just to show that I am indeed a geek, majorly, if you didn't know that already. Okay, there's the abstract. I'm gonna read it word for word. Not really. Uh, I'm going to start with a question because uh, I was at Amgen for a number of years, started before that at Immunex. Immunex bought Amgen and uh, it's a traditional biotech. I'm sure all of you have heard of Amgen and love the work there, love the work we did, uh, love the therapeutic work that we did, the impact that we had. Um, and, and knew that it took years and years and lots of money to make a drug, a biologic space drug and lots of people, and lots of sites, and lots of churn, and lots of failure. And failure is not necessarily bad if you learn from it, but it's expensive. And so who can guess? In 2014, there was a tough study that was put out. And if you have seen this slide before, especially if you work at LabKey, don't answer. And if you do answer, uh, Frank, head of security. Uh, Frank, where are you? He's going to escort you out. And, oh, there you are. Okay. He told me you said a security. So if you, if you know the answer, don't answer. But if you have a guess, give me a guess. What do you think it costs to develop a drug from discovery to market, including failures? What's your guess? I'll, I'll start the bid at 50 million. <laughs> All right, no, go more. What's that? One billion? That's a lot of money. That's more than I have in my pocket. Uh, who, who else has a guess? Here's some guesses. One billion is close. Not really. No one? $2.6 billion to develop one drug. One. And that's a, yeah, that's a B, B billion. And that's insane. And I know that it's insane. You know that it's insane. The world knows that it's insane, but what do we do about it? it, it there's, there's nothing that we can do. Research is expensive. It takes a lot of money to run the assays, develop the cell lines, and uh, do the research, do the animal studies, and get that drug from somebody's brain to somebody's body. And uh, clinical trials are, are hugely expensive in and of themselves, and I'm not even going to touch on that. So it's expensive. And we knew this. And, and we also knew that about because of that, predominantly because of that, about 80% of the planet can't afford these therapies. Our, our CEO who founded Just was in a village in Africa and looked around and said, no one here will see these drugs. No one. There's no way that it will ever be affordable when you're talking about $100,000 for a treatment for a biologic. It's just not feasible. Even with biosimilars, they, they haven't really dropped in price that much. So what do we do about this? This is why we were formed. We formed as a company October 1st, 2014 with the mission of greatly reducing the cost of biologics at least tenfold. Can we reduce the cost tenfold and enable them to hit a global market? Can we get these drugs around the world? And uh, not only just to, to get them uh, uh, to open up a market, but to get them into people that really, really need these drugs. So that's why we are a company. And the way that we're going to go about this is speed. Um, and this is post-discovery. I'm more of a discovery guy. At Amgen, I was in discovery. And that's uh, a black hole in itself uh, because there's just so much that fails and so much that you don't know that you have to learn and have to do research on. But post-discovery, when you hand somebody a molecule, it says this works in animals, it works for the biology, we think that you can make it into a drug, and it, will, it may pass clinical trials 10 months to a filing. And we, we want to be able to increase our capacity to be able to do 10 molecules a year and we're a 55-person company right now, so this is pretty daunting. And we want the cost to be less than $10 a gram. So when Jim, the CEO, came to me and said, hey, what are you, doing, what are you gonna do after Amgen shuts down the site? I said, I, I don't know, I'm gonna go to the beach. Uh, he said, instead, let's drop the, drop the time, increase the capacity, drop the cost of $10 a gram. It's currently about 200 bucks a gram just for cost of goods, so this is a 20-fold decrease. I said, that, 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 all of that's impossible, so sign me up, uh, because that's what's fun, right? Impossible tasks, that's what we like to do. So this, this didn't really show up here, but you can kind of see where the pipe 
goes, and you can see what the width of the pipe is. Some of the pipes are long. It takes a long time to do cell line development. It takes a long time to do all of the analytical methods. Some of the pipes are narrow. You can't really do much of it at once. Uh, cell line development especially, you can't really do very much at once. Bioreactors, you only have a few slots. And so how do we get from this DNA, designing a molecule and pushing it through the entire process to manufacturing to get to a commercial product quicker? Well, that's where, that's where we're applying our technology. So we really think of ourselves as a technology development company. We're a technology design company. But we want to apply our technologies to our own pipeline. And to be fair, it's easy for us to come in with biosimilars, and it makes sense for us to come in with biosimilars as an early runway to be able to get those onto the market cheaply and quickly. Uh, but we're eventually going to be uh, applying this technology to our own pipeline. So can we shorten that pipeline, widen the pipeline across every single step? My world is right here, uh, designing the molecule. And um, in designing that molecule, we can design it not just to be efficacious, not just to be able to hit the right biology, but how do you design a molecule so that when you do viral clearance, low pH doesn't cause it to unfold? So that when you're making it in high quantities and pushing it into a cell, wanting a cell to produce high titer, it doesn't get backed up in cellular organelles. I've seen, this is a side story, you can uh, thank me later. I, I've seen cells get so backed up with antibody because it can't process it fast enough that it, it forms high concentrations, intracellularly crystallizes, and the crystals grow so large it bursts the sides of the cell. There's a couple of microscopy papers by Haruki Hasegawa out of Amgen that shows that, it's astounding. So how do you make the molecule stable enough so that it can secrete quickly and so that cell can churn out lots of material without it killing the cell or killing the system? And then when it does secrete, how do you make it so that it doesn't aggregate, particulate, form gels? And then later, when you're, when you're processing this molecule, how, how do you treat it with different purifications? How do you treat it in the different analytical methods? How, how does it survive through this process design? And, and that's not easy to do. So you're not just designing a molecule for efficacy, but for manufacturability. And then from our perspective, we want to get these molecules into the world. And when you get them into the world, you're going to break cold chain. You're in sub-Saharan Africa delivering a trio, a cocktail of antibodies that are uh, active against HIV. You might be delivering these in a broken cold chain on the back of a motorcycle on a dirt road. And I, I just shudder to think that my molecule is going to be vibrating like this. We had an antibody at Amgen where if you went like this in the vial, it would form a, a gel that you could turn that vial upside down and it wouldn't flow. And so shaking things are bad. But we made, made, we made a few modifications based on our, our tool set and our, our application of different algorithms that we have to design the molecules. And, and six modifications maintained efficacy and made it a liquid upon agitation. So these are the kinds of things that we design for. But can we design a cell that produces the highest titer? Can we design vectors so that we have targeted integration? So our, we're targeting in the genome where our, where our desired antibody is going so it produces the highest titer? Can we apply robotics across the entire pipeline so that we can handle plates of material, not just one? When I design a molecule and test it with targeted integration, can my tested cell be the final cell line? We don't even have to do cell line development. Can we cut six months out of the process completely? These are the things that we're working on and inventing. We have a, a mass spec method called the multi-attribute method. There's a consortium out there in the industry that's head by, headed by Rich Rogers, who's at Just that uh, looks at attributes of a molecule in a very fast way via mass spec. We're planning to hook one of these up to a bioreactor so we can watch a bioreactor in real time and see what the product is looking like. Where are the post-translational modifications, the clippages, the cleavages, uh, the oxidation sites? What does the glycosylation look like in real time? But when we do that, how do we design a molecule so that it passes this level of stringency? And then designing a manufacturing facility. Here's another question for you. What did it cost you know, 10, 15 years ago to build a plant to make a drug? Any ideas? If you know the answer, don't, get, don't answer. But if you can have a go, oh, the same guy, man, you're brave. Half a billion. Half a billion. It's one billion. So you were off by a little more than half before. But yeah, you need to double, your, double down. So um, 
It's about a billion dollars to build a plant, and that plant is really good at making one drug, and if you shut down that drug, you'd have to steam clean it, and, and you'd have downtime, and it's hugely expensive. Well, recently, uh, Mike, Mike Vanderveer, who's at Just, designed a facility for Amgen that was built in Singapore for 200 million, five-fold decrease. You may say, wow, five-fold decrease, you're done. We're not done. We're building these. Right now, it's about 50 to 60 million, and we're planning to get it down to about 40 to 50 million to build a manufacturing facility for a biologic. That's astounding, but it's what we're doing. So that's kind of a, a background of the company. So now I want to start talking about the, the things that we do, the data that we collect, and why we need LabKey. You, you notice I'm not talking about LabKey, and I'm not, I'm not really going to, because uh, I don't use it. So. Um, <laughs> Yet, yet, Ryan, Kevin, let's get cranky. No, so we've started testing LabKey Biologics, and Ryan is going to be talking to you about the LabKey Biologics product after I'm done. And, and we are chomping at the bit, the entire company is chomping at the bit to get all of our data into this system. So one of the, one of the things that we do in designing the molecule, this is one of the anti-HIV antibodies. It's a broadly neutralizing antib antibody against HIV that we're working on in partnership with the Gates Foundation and, and others uh, coordinated by the Gates Foundation. And massive amounts of, of opportunity, let's call it, to modify this molecule. But we look at things like deamidation and isomerization. And there, I don't know what my audience is. Many of you are going, deama what? But, a, a, a protein has side chains. Those side chains can form ring structures with the backbone, and then the backbone breaks. And when that happens, you're, you're going to lose efficacy on the molecule at worst. At best, it's, it's something that you have to qualify and annotate and tell the FDA about. It's, it's something you'd rather not have. Glycosylation and cysteines. But this one I have in bold, because folding and thermal stability turns out to be extremely important. Shaking on the back of a motorcycle, of course, you can think stability is better. But if it folds better, and it, the cell can export more. And if it folds better and the cell exports more, then it doesn't aggregate. It doesn't particulate. It doesn't form protein-protein interactions. So you have a higher yield. And tighter in yield are huge in breaking down costs. And so this is something that we're really working toward to, to get this. We have tools to do this, but we'd like to in, improve it tremendously. And one of the ways we're improving it is I have a Gates-funded postdoc. And my postdoc is, uh, um, he's from the David Baker's group, so does a lot of protein design work. And so he's done, he's done some protein design to develop libraries of proteins off of parents. Like, let's just change it in you know, hundreds and thousands of versions and do all these different versions of these, of these proteins. And, and then test them under different conditions. Can I stress it with temperature? Denaturants, ethanol. Ethanol is a denaturant. You should stay away from it. This stuff's poison. And uh, if you don't, if you don't know, that's the stuff you, you, you know is in beer. So um, hitting it with low pH conditions and more, even more than that. So what can we what can we stress this molecule with? And and if you think about it, this this ties to taking a protein through a process. If you're if you handing a protein to a process group and they're getting it ready for a clinical trial and they have to change their process to meet my molecule, that's slow and expensive and really expensive. And the molecule can even die if they can't get the process to fit in a way that would be manufacturally sub manufacturable, uh, sustainable, and cost effective. And so it's better to design the molecule to fit a standard process. You don't have to change the process at all. And so generating huge yeast libraries stressing these libraries, getting the results, and then feeding that back to design new libraries. This is a huge amount of data, and we have to have a place to put it, and that's where LabKey comes in. And so we're going to be shoving all of this into LabKey. And then eventually getting enough data to generate um, machine learning, data analysis tools, even human understanding of first principles to be able to improve those design methods. And to do this, we, we're collecting a little bit of data. Does it bind? Does it produce? So a lot of molecules, a little bit of data. Very shallow pool. But we can, we can try another method where you take cells and put our DNA into a variance, multiple, multiple variants, try a lot of different uh, variants on a parental molecule, and put it directly into, into cells that we're going to grow 
and be nice if this were my final cell line, but uh, right now it wouldn't be. But like in the Chinese hamster ovary cells, something that you would normally use to produce a drug, and then sort those for the properties that I want. But I can also plate these. And when I plate these, I can do a lot, I can, I can calculate a lot of data, or assay a lot of data. I can take it into assays that generates data that allows me to do new designs. But this is a lot of data. This is tens, hundreds of thousands of, of molecules that we're doing in one batch and, and getting a lot of data. Some of the data that we're planning to capture, like thermal unfolding, um, I, I described the multi-attribute method, solubility, chemical unfolding, self-interaction. If it self-interacts, this is, this is something that's, that's you know, nice when you think about going to the doctor. You have an antibody, it has to be concentrated at like 150 mg per mil, and it becomes very viscous. It's this thick, gooey mess, and they have to inject it into you, and it hurts really bad. So yeah, it reminds me, I need a flu shot. I hate shots. So um, I, most people hate shots, so you don't want it to hurt. So we're trying to design around high viscosity. It just doesn't behave well. Static thermal aggregation, um, can you, you know, stressing it with temperature, stressing it with shaking, all of these different things that we're doing, instead of getting a little bit of data, we're going to have a lot of molecules and a lot of data. And that helps us generate even more data that we can apply machine learning data science methods to. So it's really cyclical, right? I mean, normally we design a molecule, it goes into our pipeline, we do some screening, we do some, some, some predictive tools, and you have a, an optimized molecule that comes out the other side that's ready for our process. And that's not where the data stops, though. We capture all of this data as well, even when we're doing our regular process in, in our process development group, capture all of that data and bring it back in to, re, to have new methods to be able to redesign our molecules. So I talked a little bit about manufacturing. So the, the molecules are on the far early side, the manufacturing on the far, far late side. And I mean, the guy that's in charge of this, he doesn't even think, when I talk about molecules, he glazes over. He just thinks of it as a, as a product. Well, not really. He's interested and worried about it. This is what that facility looked like before the billion dollar facility. This is the $200 million facility that's flexible. We're building these J-pods. I wish I could show you this video. We have a video, I can't show it to you. But it shows these pods. They're, they're like double wide trailers. So you can build a warehouse that's metal frame. It has to be somewhat clean because you have to gown up in it and things like that. But it's just a, a metal frame warehouse. It's cheap and fast. It has to have water, it has to have power, it has to have the things you need to put into a clean room, but then these clean rooms are standalone trailer size clean rooms. If you need capacity, you add more. If you need to repurpose them, these three can be making this drug, this one can be making that one, these two can be making this other one. And they use disposables, so I don't have to steam clean the entire thing to change my drugs. Instead of it being weeks of downtime, it's a day because it's disposables inside of the equipment. And all of the analytics can be done inside here too. So the, the purification and everything inside of these clean rooms. It's the most expensive clean room space on the planet, but you don't need much of it. Instead of making an entire building clean room, it's these little tiny pods. So that's what we're doing on the manufacturing side to be able to reduce the cost of manufacturing tremendously. And we're currently building a facility in China to do this, it's, it's under construction. And we've announced internally a second one that we're gonna start soon, I can't talk about that. But where do we capture all of this data? You guys know, and you probably still do this, it was just in the round table sessions, and this is still done, paper notebooks. Aren't they lovely? Uh, paper notebooks, I, have, I, I had stacks of paper notebooks and they don't belong to me, so I don't have them anymore, they're at Amgen, but uh, they all got microfilmed. But I'd, you have these stacks of paper notebooks, and somebody would ask you a question. You'd go, oh, man, I remember four years ago doing that. And you'd have to go look it up. And it's not, just, it's not just the single point of data. It's how did I do it? What did I do? Who did I talk to? And we need to capture more than just the analytical data says that it aggregated at 12% or my yield was 90%. We need to capture all of the knowledge that we have so that when I leave the company, and I'm not leaving the company, when I leave the company, this is in a brain, not a brain, but it's in LabKey. 
if we can do it or somewhere. And so there was an example of somebody at Amgen that wanted to look at viscosity, wanted to look at antibody viscosity. And they said, I, I know we have like three dozen molecules that we've measured viscosity on. We've measured it at various concentrations. I want to find that data and see if I can find some structure property, some surface property, or, or something that can help me understand and predict when an antibody is going to be highly viscous. And so she set out to find that data. It took her interviewing, reading PowerPoint, reading Word documents, digging through lab notebooks about three months to get the data it should take. 48 seconds, I think, to do that. We, we, shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be in this world anymore. And, and so enter lab key biologics. We, we knew that we needed this. There are solutions out there that will do biologics types of uh, data capture and entity registration. But they're, you know, in my mind, they're about 90% solutions. So we knew we'd have to code to them anyway. And we found out about LabKey Biologic, or LabKey, and we said, okay, it's an open source platform, and we could take the open source platform and develop it ourselves and, and spend man hours and, and consult. Or we could just go to them, and, and thankful for Elizabeth being here in the room, this is our first contact. Uh, uh, we could go to LabKey, pitch this idea of a biologics platform and see if there's an idea, you know, if there's, a, they buy into the idea that we could build this system. So we've walked them through, this is kind of our workflow, and this will be, this will be common to anybody making a biologic. You have a molecule sequence, it, it's, uh, you put that with a vector and you get a construct, you have a cell line that builds an expression system, you put in media, you can build a stable cell line or do transient transfection, uh, you do harvest or multiple harvests off that cell culture run. Then you process it. You um, can process it multiple times, like for purification or, or various ways you touch that sample. And eventually a sample that's sitting in a freezer that's a protein lot that you would put into an animal or, or do some assay on. And, and so if we can capture the reagent, the media, the expression system, everything that we do, we can start asking questions of this data. And we can start asking them in a way that allows us to improve the process across everything we do. And if you have workflow as part of this, not only can I ask about the molecule and the data, but I can ask, where are the bottlenecks? Where do we need to automate? Where do I need to hire? Where do we need to do technology development? Um, where are we spending our time? And so this is kind of the, the core entity. And then the idea is with LabKey, not only register the entity, but all of the data that goes along with any entity. So uh, while you're doing harvest, you have MAM data, or you're, you have, uh, during a cell culture run, you have oxygen levels, you have glucose feed levels uh, on, the, on the samples, all of those biophysical characterizations that I showed you, everything gets captured on these entities. And so this, this large space of data starts to become amenable to these machine learning methods, and this is what I'm excited about. Can I, I, don't, I don't care if I understand why viscosity is happening, because really it happens through multiple different ways. I, I would just like to know that I can fix it. And so not only are we capturing things like viscosity, if there's an isoform, if your cleav cleavages are happening, or there's uh, an isomerization that happens, or oxidation, or weird gl uh, glycosylation that happens, the system will capture isoforms as well. So just by looking at a molecule set, you can see I changed the leader sequence, I, I have mass spec data, all on one molecule. And so it conglomerates all of your data together as you're working on a different molecule. And so right now, out in the field, there are these methods. So like I talked about isomerization. So these people have taken multiple molecules where they've measured these attributes, come up with these uh, equations to predict based on their training set, or these workflows to predict based on their training set, like is it exposed, is it within this distance, uh, does it, is it uh, electronegative, uh, well, what's its surface area of this atom, how close are these, and all these different attributes. And if you apply it to their training set, it works beautifully. And it, it predicts the training set like perfectly. It's, a, it's amazing, but when you apply it to something that's not in the training set, it fails miserably because they did it on a dozen molecules. <coughs> And it's just not enough. We need thousands, tens of thousands of molecules. 
in a, in a structured data system to be able to, to throw this kind of stuff away and be able to predict if something's going to isomerize. I don't want to have to make this. I don't want to have to test it, and I don't want to wait two years for it to fail and come back to design and, and lose two years of work because of it. So it's, it's a problem that we have to solve, and we do it with data. So what do I need? I need large amounts of data. I need it all captured in a structured way, and I need data mining and machine learning. I have an open position right now, so if you know anyone that's a, that knows the biologics domain and is really, really amazing in machine learning and data science, then uh, send them to me. You snap my QR code at the beginning, so you've already got my contact info. And, and so this, this is what I need. Somebody that understands how to build deep neural networks, understands uh, deep data systems, they can build support vector machines, and, and that knows how to act on this. And we're not only going to apply this to, to molecule design. I show this because the Gates Foundation is funding this position, and they're interested in designing the molecule so that it can be cheaply produced. We're interested in building these manufacturing sites that have J-pods. We call them J-pods. We're going to be putting them all over the world. And if you have something all over the world that's manufacturing your drug for you, you don't want to have to put in people that have decades of experience into there just to watch the system when a computer could do a pr perfectly good job. So one of the things we'd like to do with machine learning is allow it to control the manufacturing itself. And if we have enough data to build in the systems, it can look and see my, my system is failing, the cell viability is going down, and a human may not even know why. A human would just stop the lot, throw it away, start over. And that's, a, that's hugely expensive. We don't want to do that. It's better if a machine could come in and say, you need to ramp the, the turbine in this way and add oxygen this way and add these things to your feed and put copper in the media, and suddenly we're getting tighter again. That's what we need. We need to be able to generate enough of a data set so that we can have the computers controlling the bioreactors all over the world. And that's what we're heading toward, to be able to do it cheap, no failures, unless you're doing science, and then you fail most of the time. Yeah. So all of these entities enable questions. And I've asked some of these questions, like, where do I need to automate or hire? But just to be able to ask, show me everything that has high molecular weight above this percentage, and list the, the instrument that was used, the person that was used, what day of the week was it? Uh, I, my background is NMR and structural biology. The best data that I would ever collect was Christmas because no one's in the building. There's no one walking, pushing carts around. The, you know, the, the floor's not vibrating. Big pieces of metal going by the magnet. Best data. So can we get that out of the data set? Can we ask these kinds of questions? You know, what antibodies against this target have, have high efficacy, low aggregation, least number of in silico hotspots? Easy question to ask, but only if I have the data. So we really need to be able to get to the point where we can make the best molecule fit the easiest process, the fastest process, and manufacture the highest amount of titer and yield so that we can get these biologics to people who really need them the world over. This is Ebola, and this is a real patient. And and this is somebody who really needs these biologics. And there's a trio of antibodies that uh, was produced by um, multiple researchers that was taken in by Matt Bio, funded by the Gates Foundation. And we did some work on these to try to build out cell lines for them to be able to respond to Ebola quickly. And uh, the company, Matt Bio, their process is to make everything in tobacco. So they actually grow tobacco, harvest the tobacco, and extract the plant. It's too slow. It's an interesting idea. It's fun science. It's too slow. So that we became engaged to be able to, to build cell lines to do it. And um, th this is unfortunate. It happens so fast that by the time it ramps up, it dies out, thankfully. But, uh, but can, we, can we get fast enough that we can act on things like this? These are friends of mine. Uh, Mike here had uh, a disease called polycythemia, where you're your bone marrow overproduces red blood cells. It caused him to lose his spleen, and he was going to uh, die from it. But he had a bone marrow transplant, and it was successful. And while he was having the bone marrow plant transplant, his wife was in marketing, and she was helping him through that. He's essentially a cancer patient, because they, they give you massive doses of chemotherapy. You're isolated. You're in a hospital. And they take away all of your bone marrow, and then they transplant. And while she was going through that process with him, 
uh, her company downsized and she was laid off. And then she was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. And then she was diagnosed with stage three ovarian cancer. And in, in seeing what he went through, when she got laid off, she decided she wanted to go back to school to be a nurse. And it was after she decided to go to nursing school that, that she got diagnosed with these two cancers. And she's still struggling. This has been, I think, eight years. She just had a recurrence. So this is her hair shaving party. She donated her hair and uh, before she lost it to chemo. But at Amgen, they're working on drugs for ovarian cancer. And I was part of it. And to, to see the impact that we have, it's not just how do I code to store some data in a computer. It's not just how do I make a workflow work? How do I do this bioinformatics? This is what we're doing. This is why it's important. And this is why we can't stop. So I want to get these drugs to everybody, and I want to get them there now. So let's, let's keep working. <laughs>